evolution fossils the process of fossilization takes a very long period of time in order to study the fossil the land is excavated fossils are collected from different levels of depths a systematic study of these fossils and its occurrence revealed that the deepest layers were found to have fossils of invertebrates. In layers above them were found prehistoric fish-like animals, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals respectively in that order. This suggests that perhaps this was the order in which the animals appeared on the earth. Evolution and Classification Based on these principles, we can work out the evolutionary relationships of the species we see around us. It is a sort of going backwards in time. We can do this by identifying hierarchies of characteristics between species. Similarities among organisms will allow us to group them and then study the groups. For this, we need to find out which characteristics decide more fundamental differences among organisms and which ones decide less basic differences? What is meant by characteristics anyway? Characteristics are details of appearance or behavior, in other words, a particular form or a particular function. Let me give you an example. That we have four limbs is thus a characteristic. That plants can do photosynthesis is also a characteristic. Some basic characteristics will be shared by most organisms. The cell is the basic unit of life in all organisms. The characteristics in the next level of classification would be shared by most, but not by all organisms. A basic characteristic of cell design that differs among different organisms is whether the cell has a nucleus. Bacterial cells do not, while the cells of most other organisms do. Among organisms with nucleated cells, which ones are unicellular and which ones multicellular? That property marks a very basic difference in body design because of specialization of cell types and tissues. Among multicellular organisms, whether they can undertake photosynthesis or not will provide the next level of classification. Among the multicellular organisms that cannot do photosynthesis, whether the skeleton is inside the body or around the body will mark another fundamental design difference. We can see that even in these few questions we have asked, a hierarchy is developing that allows us to make classification groups. The more characteristics two species will have in common, the more closely they are related. And the more closely they are related, the more recently they will have had a common ancestor. Here an example will help. A brother and a sister are closely related. 
they have common ancestors in the first generation before them, namely their parents. A girl and her first cousin are also related, but less than the girl and her brother. This is because cousins have common ancestors, their grandparents, in the second generation before them, and not in the first one. We can now appreciate that classification of species is in fact a reflection of their evolutionary relationship. We can thus build up small groups of species with recent common ancestors, then supergroups of these groups with more distant common ancestors and so on. Evolution by Stages A question that arises here is, if complicated organs such as the eye are selected for the advantage they provide, how can they be generated by a single DNA change? Surely such complex organs will be created bit by bit over generations? But how can each intermediate change be selected for? Even an intermediate state such as a rudimentary eye can be useful to some extent. This might be enough to give a fitness advantage. Insects have them, so does an octopus, and so do vertebrates. And the structure of the eye in each of these organisms is different enough for them to have separate evolutionary origins. Also, a change that is useful for one property to start with can become useful later for quite a different function. Feathers, for example, can start out as providing insulation in cold weather. But later, they might become useful for flight. In fact, some dinosaurs had feathers. Although they could not fly using the feathers. Birds seem to have later adapted the feathers to fly. This of course means that birds are very closely related to reptiles since dinosaurs were reptiles. It is all very well to say that very dissimilar looking structures evolve from a common ancestral design. It is true that analysis of the organ structure in fossils allows us to make estimates of how far back evolutionary relationships go. But those are guesses about what happened in history. Are there any current examples of such a process? The wild cabbage plant is a good example. Humans have, over more than 2000 years, cultivated wild cabbage as a food plant and generated different vegetables from it by selection. This is of course artificial selection rather than natural selection. So some farmers have wanted to select for very short distances between leaves and have bred the cabbage we eat. Some have wanted to select for arrested flower development and have bred broccoli or for sterile flowers and have made the cauliflower. Some have selected for swollen parts and come up with kohlrabi. Some have simply looked for slightly larger leaves and have come up with a leafy vegetable called kale. 
would we have thought that all these structures are descended from the same ancestor if we had not done it ourselves? Another way of tracing evolutionary relationships depends on the original idea that we started with. That idea was that changes in DNA during reproduction are the basic events in evolution. If that is the case, then comparing the DNA of different species should give us a direct estimate of how much the DNA have changed during the formation of these species. This method is now extensively used to define evolutionary relationships. Evolution should not be equated with progress. In such an exercise of tracing the family trees of species, we need to remember certain things. Firstly, there are multiple branches possible at each and every stage of this process. So, it is not as if one species is eliminated to give rise to a new one. A new species has emerged. But that does not necessarily mean, like the beetle example we've been thinking about, that the old species will disappear. It will all depend on the environment. Also, it is not as if the newly generated species are in any way better than the older one. It is just that natural selection and genetic drift have together led to the formation of a population that cannot reproduce with the original one. So, for example, it is not true that human beings have evolved from chimpanzees. Rather, both human beings and chimpanzees have a common ancestor a long time ago. That common ancestor is likely to have been neither human nor chimpanzee. Also, the first step of separation from that ancestor is unlikely to have resulted in modern chimpanzees and human beings. Instead, the two resultant species have probably evolved in their own separate ways to give rise to the current forms. In fact, there is no real progress in the idea of evolution. Evolution is simply the generation of diversity and the shaping of the diversity by environmental selection. The only progressive trend in evolution seems to be that more and more complex body designs have emerged over time. However, again, it is not as if the older designs are inefficient, so many of the older and simpler designs still survive. In fact, one of the simplest life forms, bacteria, inhabit the most inhospitable habitats like hot springs, deep sea thermal vents, and the ice in Antarctica. In other words, human beings are not the pinnacle of evolution, but simply yet another species in the teeming spectrum of evolving life. Human Evolution The same tools for tracing evolutionary relationships, excavating, time dating, and studying fossils, as well as determining DNA sequences, have been used for studying human evolution. There is a great diversity of human forms and features across the planet. So much so that 
For a long time, people used to talk about human races. Skin color used to be the commonest way of identifying these so-called races. Some were called yellow, some black, white or brown. A major question debated for a long time was, have these apparent groups evolved differently? Over recent years, the evidence has become very clear. The answer is that there is no biological basis to the notion of human races. All humans are a single species. Not only that, regardless of where we have lived for a past few thousand years, we all come from Africa. The earliest members of the human species, Homo sapiens, can be traced there. The genetic footprints can be traced back to our African roots. A couple of hundred thousand years ago, some of our ancestors left Africa while others stayed on. While the residents spread across Africa, the migrants slowly spread across the planet from Africa to West Asia, then to Central Asia, Eurasia, South Asia, East Asia. They travel down the islands of Indonesia and the Philippines to Australia and they cross the Bering Land Bridge to the Americas. They did not go in a single line, so they were not traveling for the sake of traveling, obviously. They went forwards and backwards with groups sometimes separating from each other, sometimes coming back to mix with each other, even moving in and out of Africa. Like all other species on the planet, they had come into being as an accident of evolution and were trying to live their lives the best they could. Fossil fuel solid fuels, about 200 to 300 million years ago, decomposition of plant tissue by the bacteria resulted in the removal of hydrogen and oxygen from cellulose of plants, leaving the contents rich in carbon content, forming various types of coal. This process is called carbonization. A lot of harmful gases such as carbon monoxide carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide are produced by the burning of these fuels. Liquid fuels Liquid fuels are formed from the remains of tiny sea creatures that lived million and million years ago. When they died, they sank to the seabed. Here they were covered with the sand and mud. Due to heat and pressure of rocks, these dead creatures changed into oil droplets forming a pool of oil. Natural gas is also produced by rotting of these creatures. On refining this crude oil, different liquid fuels are obtained such as diesel, petrol, kerosene, tar and paraffin wax.